the people. We're here to hear Cornell West this afternoon. Thank you so much for your patience. There's been a lot of people wanting to talk to Dr. West. There have been a lot of people coming in. The program has been difficult. We've needed chairs. So thank you so much for your patience, and thank, thank you so much for being here. On behalf of the Upstate Coalition to Ground the Drones and End the Wars, the Sears Q's Peace Council, and the many, many co-sponsoring organizations listed in the program on the back, full page on the back, I'd like to welcome you to an amazing day of education and action. My name is Carol Baum. I work with both Upstate Coalition and the Peace Council, and I'll be your facilitator for this part of the day. Thanks to the many people who helped make this event happen, with a special thanks to Tucker Missionary Baptist Church for this lovely space. Their pastor, Dr. Leslie J. Johnson II, their office administrator, Rachel Levins, who has been incredibly helpful in making this happen, and of course, Dr. Cornell West. So now I'm going to introduce Rachel Levins from Tucker Missionary Baptist Church to welcome us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I welcome you into the house of the Lord on behalf of our pastor and in his absence, Reverend Dr. Leslie J. Johnson II. It has been a privilege and a problem and, and um, a special privilege to work with the Peace Council. You know, we do look to reach out to our community. We wish you all would come and have service with us also. But uh, it's been a great opportunity to work with everyone and on um, behalf of our pastor, we are very happy that we, were able to, we are able to host you today. The flyer you received lists the program for this afternoon, as well as information about the Upstate Coalition and Hancock Air National Guard Base. And if you're from the Syracuse area, ways to learn more about this locally. And I just want to say that we did hear that Dr. West will be joining us at the base. Yeah. The Upstate Coalition came together in 2010 and is primarily composed of groups and concerned citizens from Binghamton, Buffalo, Ithaca, Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, points in between, and some beyond. We have focused our efforts on Hancock, about a 15-minute drive from here, from which starting in 2009, Reaper drones were piloted over Afghanistan, and it's become a center of training for Reaper maintenance technicians, pilots, and sensor operators. After the program, everyone is invited to a permitted rally and walk to the base. We now have a short slideshow created by Ithacan's Una Grady Deflam and <laughs> Leah Grady Savitz. The song is by Buffalo activist Vicki Ross and sung by Ithacan. Alice Saltonstall. So hopefully this will work. I'm worried for my family and the people of my village. I request that U.S. courts protect my sister, my family, and my village. I wish the U.S. courts will be able to save all humanity from drones. Killing 
sons, fathers, daughters, and wives, drones very beautiful lights. Five young men were killed having tea. They gathered quite innocently since the death of my brother-in-law. I have no peace of mind left at all. Drones bury beautiful lives. Drones bury innocent lives. Killing sons, husbands, daughters, and wives. Drones bury beautiful lives. At home I can't keep on the light. It draws too much attention at night. My folks fear a drone strike by mistake. Children, families, all of us quake. Drones bury beautiful lives. Drones bury innocent lives. Killing sons, fathers, daughters, and wives. Drones bury beautiful lives. The love of humanity, the rule of law and sanity. How can we forget what's true when we know love alone sees us through? Drones bury beautiful lives. Drones bury innocent lives. Killing sons, fathers, Warm greetings from a very cold cell. As I prepare to go before you today, I write a few words about why we go to Hancock Air Base. We come saying clearly with our words and deeds that we will not be complicit with our government's war crimes. We come to resist the use of killer drones. Killer drones kill the innocent, violate national sovereignty, terrorize and bully smaller and weaker nations and people, almost always people of color. Their use is illegal, violating the supreme laws of our land. We are all responsible for the crimes of our government. To the extent that we allow our government to kill whoever it wants, whenever it wants, however it wants, with no accountability, we send the message here and around the world that if you are the biggest bully, you can act above the law. My observation here at the Justice Center, where I am in jail, is that women are doing time for open container, dirty urines, and theft to support their drug addiction. Our jails and prisons are filled with men and women, 2.3 million of them, mostly poor, disproportionately people of color. Their offenses cannot be compared to those of the leaders and commanders of this country and military, the largest, most powerful in the world. Our military kills the innocent with impunity as a matter of policy and spends trillions of dollars stolen from our children and future generations to maintain its superpower status. The corollary I see is that to the extent that we fail to hold ourselves and our government accountable for the big crimes of mass murder and grand theft, we will continue to scapegoat others here and around the world, those most marginalized already, 
people of color, and poor people. We will continue to profile, target, criminalize, imprison, torture, and kill them as a matter of policy. Let us undergo a revolution of values that seeks peace with justice, not war, that puts humanity first, not the gods of militarism, racism, and greed. I hope we help each other in such a revolution because we are all in this together. Thank you and blessings upon you. Signed by Claire Grady to the judge. I'm proud to bring with me a good friend of mine, um, a true poet that embodies the revolutionary spirit of hip hop that a lot of you may not have witnessed because corporations have destroyed the image of every aspect of real culture in our society. Um, but he wrote a special piece about drones to share with us today in honor of Dr. West joining us. And I want to give a special thanks to all the people that have risked their lives through the lives of others and putting uh, their bodies on the line and getting arrested at Hancock Air Force Base because they're the reason we're here, they're the reason Dr. West is here, and they're the reason that, that these people in Afghanistan, the Afghan peace volunteers, have the courage to stay peaceful in a world of terror. So without further ado, how y'all doing? Good. I think, uh, I think hardship and oppression is like bad weather. It will hit the rich and the poor, but most people don't prepare for it and become victims of it. But more people are unaware of it. I'm a, a Muslim, and in Islam it's taught that oppression is worse than slaughter. To oppress someone is worse than, to, worse than killing them. To make someone live, torture them. And we find this a lot. And I know in Christianity and Islam, it's not tolerated in all, and in humanity, it's not tolerated with, with righteous people. But a lot of times we tend to focus on what's happening on the, on the TV screen in front of you instead of what's going on in, on, in other places. And that is the poison. I wrote a piece on, on drones, but I also did a piece on uh, poverty and racism. So I'm going to do the, the drone piece first. Is that OK? Yeah. <clears throat> it's called While You Were Watching TV. While you were watching Scandal last night, there was a scandal last night. You understand? While you were watching Scandal last night, there was a scandal last night. It had nothing to do with Kerry Washington cheating with the president, but the president in Washington would have to carry the scandal that shed blood in Somali and Pakistani and Yemeni residents. And while you were watching Dancing with the Stars, three lifeless babies gazed into the stars while drones tore them apart, shut up their face and aimed at their heart and heard the screams in the dark. Or maybe you were watching the cooking channel, Mothers and daughters, bodies burned to a crisp while drones loaded up the ammo, but they don't get no reward for that. <laughs> Trophies. There are over 100 babies lying in a sandy ditch. Stand and look. It's a lot worse than Sandy Hook, but it won't make the news because the government makes the news in order to control the, the views. See, see. It's mind control, but you don't mind control because terrorism is so, so bad. So we don't mind the drones that kill kids, but if we don't hear about it, do they still live? They say that if a tree falls in a forest and no one sees it, excuse me, if a drone kills 300 innocent people and no one reads it, no one cries because no one bleeds it, no one grieves it, no one breathes it, heck, we can't even conceive it. It doesn't come with a soda and a fry. What about the body slumped over on the side? They cry. 75 Pakistanis were killed, but you don't hear about that because the same day, on the same day, a famous American actor died, and he won't get no reward for that. Trophies. But you were watching two and a half men, three fathers was burned and turned into two and a half men. While you were watching two and a half men, three fathers were bombed and turned into two and a half men. Two billion dollars spent, but 
If it's not our next to kin, we overlook it like, like incarceration of blacks and Mexicans. They don't get no reward for that. Trophies. So while you were watching the scandal last night, there was a scandal last night, and it had nothing to do with Kerry Washington cheating with the president, but the president in Washington would have to carry the scandal of shed blood in Somali and Pakistani and Yemeni residents. And while you were watching Dancing with the Stars, three laughing babies gazed into the stars while drones tore them apart, shot at their face, and aimed at their heart. You can't even hear them scream in the dark. While you were watching RoboCop, cops were becoming robots. And during the commercial, innocent people became terrorists, and soon death will be too close to run. So while you choose to ignore the reality of drones, you better pray and pray and pray and hope that you don't become one. Artist and hip hop is a is is a tool, and it can be used for good and bad. And unfortunately, the masses are being affected by the bad of it. But there is good of it. There is good, and 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 it, it really gets the appreciation and the attention that it deserves. I wrote this piece for overseas and my community trying to bridge the gaps with poverty, racism, and I hope you, you, you understand. It's called Corner Store Confession. I speak for that girl who was forced to strip. I speak for that girl who got a strip and that girl on Gaza Strip. Holding a half a brick like my man on the strip, holding a half a brick, trying to get his money to flip. Last night I had a dream. I died when I ran. The last night a boy died and I ran. You can say that you can or sit in the can and even do it in the wheelchair and take it to stand. He said to me, he said, he said, life ain't fair as he drank his pitcher of beer. Young guy, he said, life ain't fair as he drank his pitcher of beer, but so unaware he couldn't bear the picture of fear. Used to smoke a box of square, slowly putting himself in a square box. These young ops wear braids and glocks. Soon to be in the cell with a guy who takes the key, twist, and lock, and he dreads it. He dreads it like twist and lock. Now he's mad at cops. Like them cops made him want that candy painted drop. A girl who was a fox and pitch on the block. Now to get the cops, you should be mad at little Wayne, Jay-Z, and D-Block. So what will it take for you to start choosing God? You gotta be locked up like one of them dudes in Oz, stuck in the limelight, loving the oohs and ahs, putting some bling bling in your Jesus piece, thinking you're giving jewels to God, rejecting the Jews from God. This is a shame that we gotta die, man. A dying man to realize you are a jewel from God. It's like, like you're bound to be deceased. Because who you riding with if Jesus walks in the street? You try to turn your back to the street just to go back to the street. Now who got your back in the street when you're lying on your back? The street. It is sad that mama won't see her son rise, so she's mourning. Mama won't see her sunrise, so she's mourning this unthinkable, like not seeing the sunrise in the morning, because when the earth revolves around your gun, when the earth should revolve around your sun, like the earth revolves around the sun, you can add and subtract, but the salt needs a sum. Hood problems. Five boys in the block, that's 13. One gun, one bullet, one shot, hit the 13. Now we treat the 13 and drop them in the casket. Kids are multiplying for reproduction, but the largest number are forced to die faster, and these rappers are causing division, and that's not acceptable, because now we are forced to be decimals. Because if he point one, then he point one, two, four going to him, three goes into you, he had a man, you had a 22 automatic, and driving the welcome to urban mathematics. Well, pipes are now used as breathing apparatus. I mean, Obama don't care, and Bush couldn't carry us, so who's gonna change our current state and status? Thinking we pets, but them carrots ain't nothing but bait for you silly rabbits. See, my hood is built on bad habits, because when you die, you can either go to the devil's basement or God's attic. So, sorry, MTV, I don't need you to pimp my ride, my wife, or my life, because that's not close. Because y'all think that Nina Penta and the Santa Maria wasn't pimped out, so now we pimped out, sitting in public housing, riding on 26s, riding on 26s, thinking we're doing something new, brother. You're wild, because slave ships wasn't sitting on 20s, my brother. They were sitting on 20,000. Mothers, fathers, and sisters at the bottom of the boat and wasn't none of them smiling. Slave masters looking at little black girls getting aroused. We have a father trying to help his own daughter, his own blood is why he was drowning. See, we ain't never seen that promised land. We ain't never seen that promised land. We ain't never seen that promised land. We were just promised land. And I, and I pray for 
Afghanistan, but there's also a war with the black man because crack is a weapon of mass destruction. So you got to focus on that and Iraq or Iran because I am everything you say I am, and every Muslim ain't down with the Taliban. Every white person ain't rich, and every black person can't break dance, beatbox, or rap. And if a girl don't want to talk to you, it don't mean she thinks he's all that. Maybe she got disrespected the last three times. She said no, thank you, and that's now how she's forced to react. See, my block is action packed because we don't act; we just react. And you would think some of them brothers is religious. If you would think they were religious, you would think they were some good Christians because they got a Jesus piece and a cross hat. But when they come across tracks like boy, come up off that. In the name of God, come up off your chain. In the name of God, come up off your chain. But it's all in your brain because if we are slaves for God, why are you putting your God on chain? Good afternoon. I'm James Rex from Epstein Road. Great crowd. Um, yeah, I got the really uh, easy job today. And I don't have to take long. I have to introduce Cornell, and it's really easy for me. Um, quite simply, Every time I see or hear him, he makes me feel really good when he's finished. Um, very quickly, because uh, very quickly, I will be off. We were in a trial a few years ago out at Hancock Air Base, and my grandson was supposed to be here. He's not here now, but he was at the trial, and he was really causing a ruckus at the point. He was two, and the judge said, uh, that young man doesn't quiet down, we're going to have to have him removed from the courtroom. <laughs> and I went, that's my baby. Um, <laughs> so uh, when he saw uh, the judge and everybody turn toward him, he quieted down for a minute. But 15 seconds after we started the proceedings, he started up again. And the judge had the uh, bailiff or the policeman in the courtroom have my daughter take him out of the court. And I just saw a picture of, uh, like, Bobby Seale and Pampers you know, <laughs> being taken out of that courtroom. And I felt so good um, when that happened. Uh, a lot earlier in my life, I was uh, watching a, a news show, Meet the Press or Face the Nation or something. I was 15 or 16, probably going through the channels looking for a football game. And I, I saw this black uh, leader, he was being questioned uh, pretty severely, and I stopped instantly. Uh, I, I took note, his demeanor seemed so different. And they would ask him, what is, what is your name, uh, sir? Your name isn't really X. And he said, they said, your name is uh, Little. And he said, uh, Little is the name of a plantation. Uh, where my ancestors probably emanated from. And X stands for the unknown. I would uh, prefer to identify myself by that from, from a really egregious known history. Um, they were throwing questions at him, like, uh, do you, would you advocate violence? And these are the kind of questions that would really make uh, civil rights leaders very apprehensive. And, he said that he would respond to anyone in the manner that he was addressed. If someone addressed him in a violent manner, that that would be, he would be inclined to uh, respond the same way. And he was so dignified um, after seeing that, I really felt empowered and I'm much better about myself uh, just observing uh, the dignity that he carried himself. That was El Hakim Miguel Shabazz of Malcolm X. Uh, later on in life, later on in life, uh, I read Beyond Vietnam by Martin Luther King. And it took me a while to get a lot older and uh, really read it. He had such a comprehensive look at the problems that were causing the world, the reasons they were causing, and some solutions, some ways to start healing it. And after I saw the genius of uh, the way he looked at it, uh, I feel good every time I, I read that speech. Well, I was watching PBS, scrolling through, and I saw this brother right here, Dr. West. I didn't know who he was. 
But when he spoke, it made me go like, oh, who is this guy? <laughs> After a while, a couple months later, I, I was listening to a show with Amy Goodman, uh, Democracy Now! And she said Cornell West was coming. Well, I live out in a trailer out in the country, but I was getting my radio set and my antenna so I would make sure I wouldn't miss a word at that point. Um, and I knew I wouldn't be disappointed, just like I know you all won't be disappointed, and I'm almost done. Um, I went to, um, and this is like kind of a weird way to tie it in, but I was in a Chinese restaurant eating some shrimp fried rice, going down, I finished it, and I got to the uh, fortune cookie. Cracked it open, and it said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that, to me, was the embodiment of the Beyond Vietnam speech, um, El Hajj Ali, with the knowledge that he had and the caring that he had for his people. And that's what I feel every time uh, that I hear Cornel West speak. Wow. And before I introduce him, I want to state that these proceedings here are being stole, uh, being uh, uh, held on uh, stolen on the dollar land. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm from Turtle Island, which they call uh, Tompkins County, stolen from Cayuga land. And this is something we need to uh, understand and recognize before we even get started. But uh, back to Dr. West, it's unbelievable um, his knowledge and his caring is uh, so evident. His knowledge you can easily get watching television or um, the books he's written. And I don't have the time to go through his accomplishments, nor do you. Uh, degrees and accomplishments, awards, unbelievable. But, but without any further ado, I feel Cornell West is a brother whose knowledge is here, and his caring is above that. It's my honor and my privilege to present, to present Dr. Cornell West. Therapy. The chocolate side of therapy. And the love was coming right back at you, man. Tell it. Indeed, I want to thank Sister Carol for her magnificent work at Syracuse Peace Council. Sister Rachel, representing this grand institution, Tucker Missionary Baptist Church, founded by Reverend Forrest Adams in 1954. Oh, 
thing called constancy in her fascinating bourgeois <laughs> formulation of it within the British imperial context. We love you, Jane. We love you. <laughs> constancy. Keeping track of every person. And when they're rendered invisible, when they're pushed to the margins, when they're pushed to the peripheral, we try to cast a spotlight on them. And you could be atheist and agnostic, you could be Buddhist, you could be Hindu like Gandhi, you could be a Jesus-loving free black man like myself. No one of us in the front of the train, we all on it together. Oh yes, we all on it together. Together. I want to salute all of you all, both here in Syracuse and in various parts of the other part of New, of New York, upstate New York. Something is happening in Syracuse and something is happening in this part of the country that you all actually have more and more been cast a spotlight on the underside of the American Empire. Absolutely. And because there's so much sleepwalking in the country, Yep. People wake up at different times, you know. Uh -huh. Henry David Thoreau realized that the wall that pond, that epigraph, what can I do to awake my fellow citizens from their sleepwalking? Well, Brother Henry, it takes a while sometimes. <laughs> That's all right. We continue to try to speak the truth, try to expose lies, try to bear witness, not in a spirit of self-righteousness. Because all of us have had moments when we were sleepwalking too. You don't come out of the womb with revolutionary fire. <laughs> like Malcolm X. <laughs> after Elijah loved him. And then after he began to outlove Elijah. <laughs> Allow that love to spill over from the chocolate side to the vanilla side to other sides of town. <laughs> oh yes. Dorothy Day, love warrior to the core. <laughs> to the core. Never forget your sister Dorothy. Yeah, I know I'm in Syracuse. The Americans, oh my God, Brother Daniel, Brother Phil, and the others. <laughs> Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, we shall never forget your witness, your truth telling, your pointing out the lies and the crimes of your own. Vicious treatment of your own precious Jewish brothers and sisters by a, a Jew hating thug named Hitler and Nazis. Edward Zaid, secular brother, he was my dear brother. Oh, yeah, my dear Palestinian brother, telling the truth, exposing lies, trying to ensure to cast a spotlight on those whose humanity rendered invisible. I want to begin with an epigraph, though, from the great W.B. Du Bois. I want you to picture in your mind, he's 89 years old. He's just emerged out of a courtroom. They had him in handcuffs. He's part of the Peace Information Center trying to rid the world of nuclear bombs. That's 17,300 now. He's cast as an enemy of the U.S. government. This is the same Du Bois founder in the late CP, first PhD at Harvard, right? The dissertation on the suppression of the African slave trade. The same Du Bois that went on to write Souls of Black Folk in 1903. The same Du Bois that left the country three years before he died. He joined the Communist Party and said, Cheer up, black folk. You'll never win in America. You better cast it on a global and international stage if you want to preserve your sanity. Mm -hmm. That's the divorce I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. He decided to embark on a trilogy, three novels at 89 years old. That's what kind of revolutionary fire he had. In that first novel called The Ordeal of Manzar, he turned to page 275. And he says, I've been wrestling the four questions all of my life. And I've yet to provide adequate responses, not just propositional answers, but responses in terms of a life lived. An embodiment and an enactment of vision. The first question, 
How does integrity face oppression? How does integrity face oppression? The second was, what does honesty do in the face of deception? What does honesty do in the face of deception? Third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? Decency do in the face of insult? And that last query, the boy says, how does virtue meet brute force? And those are the four pillars, it seems to me, that bring us together. Because if all of us are concerned with what does it mean to be human, what kind of human being will we choose to be in our brief move from our mama's womb to tomb? Mm -hmm. No accident, our English word human comes from the Latin humanda, which means burying and burial. Because yes, it's true, we are featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's who we are, we're not here that long. And the question is, what kind of person will you be? Will it have something to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue, so that when they talk about you at your funeral, they'll have something to say beyond just how many material possessions you had, how many commodities you accumulated, and how many folk you dominated. Oh yes, that's what Tucker Missionary Baptist Church is all about. That's the tradition that produced this crack vessel. I come out of Shiloh Baptist, they call it Tucker Missionary. Yes. Same end and same aim. I want to be a certain kind of human being in which in the face of brute force, in the face of care, in the face of trauma, in the face of stigma, somehow I was able to raise to a higher moral and spiritual ground that allowed me to connect myself with those who came before and tried to teach me, lo and behold, you can be a better human being no matter what your circumstances and conditions are. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the tradition I'm talking about. That's the tradition I'm talking about. I'm talking about the tradition of Emma Peel's mother when she stepped to the lectern and her baby Yes. Only child killed by cowardly American terrorists, cowardly American white supremacists, and gut bucket Jim Crow Mississippi Emmett Teal. What you got to say, Miss Teal, to the world? Speak on behalf of not just black people, not just America. Speak on behalf of the best of the human spirit. We hear your pain. We see the tears in your eyes. They kept the casket open, did they? Yep, yep. So that 50,000 people marched through Robert, Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ on the west side of Chicago in August of 1955. She said, we're going to keep that casket open. We want the world to see the night side of the American Empire. and be willing to pay a cost 
and there is an intimate relation between the preciousness of enmity and the preciousness of the children in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia. We underside the American Empire. Of course, we don't stop there. We got a lot of poor, white, precious brothers and sisters catching hay. Why? Because instead of integrity, the dealing with the effects of institutionalized cupidity, the love of money. We live in a society ruled by big banks and big corporations, disproportionately shaping how we understand ourselves and what possibility poor and working people have and what assets they have to resources that 1% that the Occupy movement rightly zeroed in on. And we could have zeroed in on the 0 0.1%. But one of the population that got 95% of the income growth in the last four years. The 1% of the population that now have 43% of the wealth in the United States when 40% of children of color live in utter poverty and 22% of all children in this nation live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world as morally obscene, spiritually profane. But where's the holy anger? Where's the righteous indignation? How somehow do we shatter the callousness and the indifference, but also the fear? Because in a society that rules, is ruled by money, the Wu-Tang Clan, Kareem, Cash rules everything around me. But it doesn't have to rule me. such a society and the intimate relation between cupidity and venality. And venality is just a fancy word of saying we live in the age of the sellout. <laughs> just give enough money, access to power, position, publicity, status, stature. And all of a sudden, the vision that you had becomes truncated. All of a sudden, you become so well-adjusted to injustice that you still think somehow that you tie the integrity. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. And it's especially so for poor people and working people, and especially so for people of color. The last thing Emma Till's mother had in mind was to tell the truth, to bear witness, to serve and sacrifice, and then generate just a whole battalion of highly successful people of color in high places who have sold their souls for a mess of pottage. Success. No, 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 no. Emma Till's mother sacrificed. My grandmother and grandfather sacrificed to produce folk who are great, and he or she is greatest among you will be his servant. Mm -hmm. The quality of your service to the least of these, the widow and the orphan, the stranger, the fatherless, the motherless, the poor working peoples. Okay, brothers and lesbian sisters, the elderly, that's the spiritual and moral focus of greatness as opposed to just being highly successful. We live in a land obsessed with dollars and smartness. <laughs> the dollars become so ubiquitous that it generates the form of idolatry that produces spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation. <laughs> insecurity, too much fear, and we wonder why it is that so many of our young folk find it so difficult to understand the genius of the Sarah Bonds and the genius of those spiritual giants 
who had callings, not just careers, who had genuine vocations tied to invocations, not just professions, who the anthem of black people lifted every voice but refused to be an echo. Mm -hmm. In America, we specialize in producing copies rather than originals. Mm. And the reason why is because the intimate connection, connecting of the dots between the Wall Street complex, the financialization of our capitalist society, 42% of the profits go to big banks, they don't produce products, they produce deals, billions of dollars remain in private hands, $2.2 trillion offshore, don't have to pay taxes whatsoever, no accountability whatsoever. And when they engage in intense forms of criminality inside of trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activities, how many Wall Street executives have gone Challenge 
becomes what? How do we tell the truth in such a way that we can still remain agents, that we don't feel debilitated, we don't feel paralyzed? When you look up at what you're up against, you say, oh my God. <laughs> they got the army, they got the navy, and they got nuclear bombs, and they got FBI, CIA. We probably got some FBI here. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Yeah, we tell the truth. That's right. We don't tell the truth. Oh yeah. Welcome, welcome. People out the wheel, come on in. Listen. Thank you for naming it. But at the same time, when you think of the history of those who engaged in their fallible quest for integrity in the face of cupidity and finality, who fundamentally wanted to be honest in the face of deception, could look at the corporate media with its massive weapons of distraction, <laughs> refusing to attend to crucial things, but attending to the bottom line. Money, 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 profits, profits, profits. And you got Fox News, mean-spirited, cold-hearted Republican propaganda. You got MSEBC, milquetoast, spineless, neoliberal, <laughs> propaganda. None of them want to talk about drones. None of them want to talk about innocent civilians. None of them want to talk about the precious children that have been killed in our name. None of them want to talk about poverty. None of them want to talk about Wall Street. No, it's just this little deodorized, sterilized, sanitized, truncated discourse that goes as political dialogue in a market-driven society. No, we refuse that kind of parochialism. We refuse that kind of provincialism. Thank God for Sister Amy Goodman had the other. Oh yeah, thank God for this. Broaden the discourse. The town of heart. Broaden the discourse. All we want is the truth. Tell us what's going on when you're privatizing our public educational system, trying to demonize the teachers. We know that rich kids get caught and poor kids get Consensus that hide then conceals the catastrophes taking place every day. Look at the treatment of the trade union movement as if somehow it's some powerful special interest that's not concerned with public interest, but the business roundtable somehow was viewed as having the same status as the trade union movement. When did that become normal? I know you all in Syracuse with rich history you have. There used to be a labor page in the newspaper. Now it's just a business page. <laughs> That's the tilt toward capital. Right. People talk about this book now, Brother Thomas's book, the Kennedy's book. Capital in the 21st century. Lo and behold, the rewards of capital are beyond that of economic growth, and therefore wages are stagnating and declining, and therefore wealth inequality is constituting a challenge to our democratic. <laughs> and then the mainstream start breakdancing like MC Hammer. <laughs> oh, we got new, new oh, really? People have been saying that for decades. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> But we have to be able to make the connection between the Wall Street complexes, the corporate multiplex, the imperial crimes, of which drones, of course, is a major manifestation. And then, of course, there is the prison industrial complex. Slavery by another name. Yes. And see, when it comes to the prison industrial complex, it's intimately connected with the wars and the military budget. Why? Because even in the midst of budgetary constraints, we can always find money for wars and for prison. Wars and for prison. Extension in terms of healthcare, 
there, but we know it's a bonanza for the pharmaceutical companies. It's a bonanza for the insurance companies to just broaden their market and have a mandate for them to have to pay. Okay, we allow for the celebration of extension, but we want justice. We just don't want extension of lack of relative Right. <laughs> oh, but Brother West, it's better. Okay, okay, it is better. But Brother Mom used to say, what, you got the back nine inches, you're pulling out six inches and want me to celebrate your progress? <laughs> pull it out, pull it out. <laughs> but the prison industrial complex is real. There's been a Marshall Plan in the last 30 years in this country. But the Marshall Plan has not gone into infrastructure, education, housing, right. and health care. It's gone into prisons for $500 billion. When I first started teaching in the pr prisons in Norfolk, about 1974, it was about 300,000 folk in prison. Today, it's 2.4 million. Yeah. 2.4 million. Disproportionately poor and very much a chocolate affair. Yes. So it's more like the National Basketball Association <laughs> or the National Hockey League. <laughs> and yet we know 12% of young black brothers and sisters flying high in the friendly sky every week, 12%. Vanilla side of town, 12%. 65% of convictions black. That means you got a criminal justice system which in some ways is itself criminal. <laughs> And from Africa and from the Caribbean, how do we connect the dots? 
connecting these dots. But lo and behold, he lives several key. You all start to connect these dots. And the rest of the country keep the track. And with the drones, there's a pillar that connects the present humanity. Not just the children, but the innocent ones in Somalia and Yemen and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And more and more in Africa, for AFRICOM now, of course, with the major expansion yeah. of U.S. military on the African continent as the struggle for resources intensifies with China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Connecting the dots. It's not going to be just a matter now of colorful faces in high places. I did celebrate with Brother Barack Obama one only because the two he was running against were dangerous. Amen. Amen. But it turns out he was dangerous too. <laughs> 45 drones. Maybe it is. Obama 400 drones. How can anybody who wants to be morally consistent? Talk about the war crimes of George Bush and not also talk about the war crimes of Barack Obama. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the brother West, he's a black man. He's a brother, he's a brother, he's a brother. I understand he's a brother. I'll fight against white supremacy too. Let some white supremacists attack him. I start swinging like Muhammad Ali in Elephant Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the right wing is dangerous. They're mistreating my brother, they disrespecting my brother, they demonizing my brother, they think he's a Muslim. <laughs> they think he's a socialist. Please. <laughs> right wing. But that is not an excuse for us not to tell the truth, expose lies, and bear witnesses when in fact his policies are tilted toward Wall Street. They'll tilt Occupation of Jewish brothers and sisters, we ought to be raising our voices at the highest level to oppose occupation. There's now a very ugly, vicious, Israeli occupation of Palestinian brothers and sisters. We ought to be raising our voices at the highest pitch against occupation. We do. We don't got to talk about that. We don't got to talk about that. We ought to recognize that uh, our, our precious Jewish brothers and sisters have a very, very distinctive history in in the history, especially of the West, in terms of just how deep hatred of Jews really is. And therefore, we understand the focus and preoccupation with security. And so the question becomes, how then do we talk honestly about the fundamental need for security so the Jews themselves do not undergo any kind of vicious attack or assault alongside the dignity and justice for Palestinians because the occupation is not going to be a means by which that Jewish security can be procured. And so we need to have a serious, robust public conversation about it. Very much so. And we can see on the note, again, very basic, that a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby, the Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby, and they are precious, precious old souls. The atmosphere has to be one which people feel as if they can enter in with people having a sense of what is at stake. Because dignity and justice for Palestinians are negotiable.
security for Jewish brothers and sisters anywhere, not just in Israel. Anywhere. It's unnegotiable. Why? Because that's what it is to be morally consistent. That's what it is to take a higher spiritual ground. Hyper-capitalism, where the attempt to deliver some particular aim, usually tied to killing and making money, is an obsession. And so it's push buttons, sensibility. You want it now, you want it overnight. Uh, you don't want to you don't want to send the soldiers so you can just have your joysticks in Arizona or Hancock or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's this obsession with short-term gain, shorter-term gain, quick gain. And people say, well, they've got a lot of positive effects. It might help someone. It may help the doctors find the sick. It may help somebody lost in the, in the Yosemite Park. Well, that's true. That's true. Technology always has two sides to it. It's always Janet's face in that regard, no doubt. But we're just trying to connect it to structures of domination, trying to connect it to forms of exploitation. Uh, and, that, and that's, I think, what's been magnificent about the Peace Council. And we should give it up for Sister Medea Benjamin and Cole Peace. Right. I mean, I think in one sense, you can call Brother Martin went down trying to eradicate poverty in the way in which Frederick Douglass was trying to eradicate slavery, or William Lloyd Garrison was trying to eradicate slavery, I'd be well trying to eradicate lynching. We need an abolitionist movement around poverty. We need a serious abolitionist movement around poverty. Huh. Now, that might be further down the road. It means that we have to come together from different communities. I mean, I think one of the worst things that has happened in our highly uh, atomized, individualized uh, society is that we think that we only should talk about an issue if it directly affects us, as opposed to being concerned about what's going on in other neighborhoods, other parts of the city, and coming together, because this issue of education means all of our des destinies are tied together. But it's just a matter of the interest group, interest group. This is the worst thing that's happened to the Black Freedom Movement. When people think of the black freedom movement, first thing they think of is what? The black community and black interests. No, 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 black folk never, we've never been a people only concerned about our interests. We have our interests, but we have integrity, honesty, decency, principles. We've always been concerned about all of those things. The same is true of the movement. Just, to, just concerned about workers, they're concerned about the quality of the society, and workers are an integral part of that, which means they ought to be concerned about the immigration issue, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, and so forth. You see. So we have to get out of these boxes and just interest group, interest group, interest group. That's the first thing. So the suburbs and the techno burbs to come together with the earth burbs. <laughs> and say, this is our issue together. We're concerned about these precious children, no matter what neighborhood or where we're from. That's the first thing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't like to engage in this algebra of blood where you compare all of these different things. All of them are so vicious, all of them are so ugly. Right. They have different scopes and different breaths and so forth, but if once we see how immoral they are, and how unjust they are, that ought to be sufficient motiv motivation to want to ensure that it doesn't happen again, be it a drone or a concentration camp or an internment camp for Japanese right. uh, in the 19, uh, 1940s and so forth. Uh, uh, very much so. I think that the, uh, but what, what is important in, 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 in when it comes to the drone for us today is the level of secrecy and lack of transparency and sheer mendacity. They just lie about it when they get caught, Brennan and the others. And that's our government that we have direct access to. And that's something that does, I think, define it in a very different way than some of the other very ugly and indescribable forms of evil, like what happened to Jewish brothers and sisters under uh, under Hitler and the Nazis, or what happened in you know, the, 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 the Congo under the Belgium, five and a half, six million people, and bishops were killed and so forth, go on and on, whole pot, we go on, Stalin and Mao, I mean, we, human beings, we've got a record. <laughs> I would want to ask the people who say drones are good, I want to hear what their argument is, I don't think.
they have an argument that is in any way persuasive, my dear sister, I think that they're following either lies that are put forward by the mainstream or they're accenting certain uses of drones that they are projecting in the future. The drones we're talking about here tonight, I don't think anybody could ever claim that forms of bombings that result in the loss of lives of innocent people, including precious young folk like yourself, is good. That's never, ever, ever, ever good. That's never.